Hi, this is Pete Markwitz, and today I'm going to talk about sustainable UX in virtual reality. And what I want to discuss is how we could use virtual reality to increase both structural and behavioral sustainability. Now, what's the scope of the talk? Well, we're going to talk about the theory of design for virtual media, because it is a little bit different from doing sustainability for physical products. We're going to talk about some of the trends in virtual design. Uh, a bit more detail about virtual reality itself and how we apply experience design or UX and VR. And finally, how can we create sustainable strategies for the virtual reality media? And I have a little bit of information about myself as an author here. Um, I originally was a scientist and I worked in biology and in the 90s I switched over to the internet and the web and I've written a bunch of books on this. And currently my big interest is actually virtual reality mediated through the browser, through the new WebVR JavaScript API that lets anyone design virtual reality who knows how to do web development. So, sustainable VR. How green is virtual reality? Well, before I do that, let's talk about what's actually going on. Right now, virtual and real augmented reality move design away from graphic design to principles of 3D design. And at the same time, we have these voice-only systems so if you look at this diagram, in the year 2000, we had web pages. And if you look in 2010, it really was quite similar in terms of the media we were working with. But by the end of the decade, 2020, we're going to have split into two more media. The first one will be immersive, which is augmented and reversal reality, which I've displayed there. And then finally, we're going to have another thing where we get rid of the interface entirely except for a voice. And those are what I call Oracle systems, things like Siri or Amazon Alexa. Now, the problem with all of this work is that very often designers treat building a website or making an app as somehow weightless, how it's green. But it's not really true that I'm green because I replaced a book with a website. So what is the carbon footprint of virtual reality? Um, I can say right now that print design, um, often a website consumes as much or more energy than if you had printed the same material. And in the case of VR, Virtual reality uses about seven times as much power as the web. And that was an estimate that was made um, because to do high quality VR, you have to have a very high performance computer and that computer uses more power. And currently those are rigs that can use up to the power of three refrigerators. And so uh, very high end gamers actually will have a higher energy budget for their virtual experiences than real people in second world countries. So, but at the same time, we have a collision going on because one thing we can predict is that virtual reality is going to become much more common. Uh, UX to date has focused on 2D design, uh, sometimes product design. Um, in contrast, game design, which is where a lot of the VR is going to come from, has operated by totally different rules. And they, the last thing they think about is efficiency or sustainability. I call it the pleasures of uninhibited excess. So to create sustainable behavior, um, we're going to have to adapt VR. It can't be like a game. And fortunately, it can be better than the web because uh, VR has a long-form nature, as I'm going to discuss. And another feature of VR is that it can really encourage sustainable behavior much better than other media. And my guess is in the next decade that it's going to be a routine focus of UX designers to encourage more sustainable behavior by creating virtual reality experiences. So we can address sustainability with VR, and we cannot leave these to the gamers. All right, now sustainable virtual design, which is the principle I use to talk about these virtual media, is that we have to look at the users and designers to create websites and apps, and we have to have behavior encouraged by these virtual media that causes users to adopt more sustainable behaviors. And we also have to make sure our overall strategy for creating these media does not degrade the internet's virtual ecosystem. So our goals are going to be efficient use of technology when we're working in VR. Uh, we're going to want users to have greater focus and attention on the content, so there's not a lot of meaningless, meaningless content wasting CPU cycles. We're going to want to have them complete tasks better. And in the case of VR especially, we're going to want an enhanced transfer of learning uh, that people can do inside virtual reality simulations to the outside world. Now, what are the megatrends? Because some of you may have said that, <clears throat> well, VR was looking big, but I haven't seen it. Isn't it just for gamers? And actually, that's not true. It is on a steady growth path. 
And it's more importantly, it's not a game, and it's going to turn into a new medium that's going to be really important in about a decade. So what makes it different? Well, both virtual reality and augmented reality create artificial, immersive 3D worlds, unlike a web page. Um, the behavioral cues, the affordances, the triggers I would use in experience design are different in 3D than they would be for, let's say, a web app or a mobile. And flat design tools that we're used to using for doing this type of work in UX cannot represent this very well. Uh, one of the other big issues is that people interact with their whole body in VR. They don't just use their hands to do it, which is what we do with typical computers. And I might say that um, in terms of whether or not this can be adopted, it is true that right now only some of the extreme gamers can stomach some of the VR out there, but everyone seems to enjoy gentle VR experiences. And so my prediction is this will become very popular. So what are the milestones we had last year? Well, the estimate was about 12% of consumers bought some sort of device. I think that's been revised down to 7 or 8%, but it's significant. Um, these products are all showing up at Best Buy. Interestingly enough, not the Apple Store, which I'll talk about. And there are consumer devices out there for someone willing to spring about five or $600 that let you walk around a room and not just sit there in a virtual experience. Um, this year, in 2017, Android software is gonna get built-in VR support. So it's gonna be possible to build VR experiences running through mobile devices using Google Cardboard very effectively. And then finally, uh, web browsers are gonna get a new JavaScript uh, library or API built in that's going to let people who build web pages now build virtu virtual reality with the same tools that they've always used. So my question is, where's your headset? Because guess what? If you're just working on the web, you're in print design, it's 1994, and someone is talking to you about the World Wide Web. And another feature is VR can do better than the web, which is one reason you need to expand beyond the web. Um, there are things that VR can do much better than the web, which we're going to talk about, and it has to do with the fact that VR is not some sort of weird web page or it's not a strange movie. It is its own media. It's not like the web. It's not like a console game. It's not like a movie. And it's actually mostly like a book because VR allows long-form storytelling, which is something you really don't do very well on the web, and you certainly can't do with an app. But you can do with a, a movie or a book. And so I've listed some of the features of VR. What we can see is that VR is very immersive. It gives high engagement. Distraction is much lower than the web. Um, the experience is more temporal, and people are locked into a, an experience in space and time. Uh, they have a very high feeling of presence compared to the web, and especially a mobile app. Um, my interactions are much more intuitive, concrete, and literal, because think about on the web, we've learned to click these abstract shapes and symbols to do things. But in VR, I grab something. And then finally, the one area that VR is sort of lagging is social. Uh, social networks on the web and in apps are really good, but on VR, it's limited, and people are just figuring out how to do that. The big thing about VR is the combination of that long form I just talked about makes it a very empathic medium. And people say VR is the empathy machine. People develop very strong emotional engagement with the content, unlike the web, but like a great book. Users are willing to keep exploring, and they have much less desire to leave or click somewhere else, which is one of the features of the web and apps. And they have a much stronger sense of having been somewhere where they finish the experience, and so it's more like the fourth wall of movies. And the higher your resolution, and the more 3D it is, the higher the empathy of people. And you can see this enormous jump in empathy if you give people high quality VR experiences versus other media. And so, the take home is VR has more emotional bandwidth than the web. So if you're designing for that, you can cause very strong emotional connections to your message. So sort of things you can do is you can put someone to a scene where they've never been. And I'd say at the knowing ghost model where you're floating there and you're experiencing something, but maybe not directly part of it. Uh, VR can actually rework your body. And I have an example of two people switching their body in VRs to develop empathy for other individuals. Um, it's very effective for therapy because I can simulate um, upsetting situations. And so treat, uh, training people not to get upset by spiders or something is something that VR is being used for right now. Uh, we can also act out behaviors. And so if you design a behavior that encourages sustainable behavior, it's much better in VR than it will be if you lecture them or give them a, a manual of what they're supposed to do.
And then finally, in VR, we can create very complicated 3D systems and let people examine these systems we always talk about in sustainability for themselves. Now, there is a dark side. It may be that VR is more addicting than online games. Who knows? We don't know yet. There hasn't been enough experience. Uh, VR is likely to follow a bell curve in engagement, and eventually we're going to get people who are addicts in the media. Now, it's also true the addiction may be worse than the web. The problem with the web compared to VR is that VR, uh, the web is distracting. You know, people click around to different websites all the time. In VR, you don't do that, so it's possible people just lock into a single experience and stay there. And that may not be a good thing. All right, well, I've been saying VR is its own medium, so let's explore that a little bit deeper. Um, I've listed a group of people who have developed the theory of experience design in VR, really over the last year. And you can look at them here, Adrian Hunter, Mike Alger, uh, Josh, uh, Josh Carpenter, they're all great to look at. And I've also listed the links in this presentation, which I'm going to be putting on Google Docs. And you can always contact me if you want to get more information. Um, these guys are all great to look at, and they've had a lot of real insights into how to do um, stuff in VR that will actually be effective with your users. So hardware formats we probably have to talk about first. One great thing about it is that smartphones are powerful enough to generate VR. So you can take a new iPhone or a new Android system and put it into something that costs almost nothing, like a Google Cardboard format, and get reasonable VR. And that's great. Now, the higher-end version of VR, which is still consumer's headset, use a dedicated desktop or laptop, and maybe about 15% of your audience at present would have something like this. Um, and some of them will have room scale, so they'll be able to walk around, but at present, their headset will be tethered to a computer in the room, so it is a little bit clumsy. Um, and the last thing I should point out, because so many UX people have Macintosh computers, there is no Macintosh powerful enough to use a headset. You cannot plug an Oculus into a Mac or an HTC Vive or anything like that. Macs flat out are not powerful enough, and uh, what's kind of worrying Apple is really not uh, doing anything about this at the point. They've said something about working in AR, but it does mean if you're a Mac-only person, you really maybe have to think outside that box if you're going to get involved in this medium. All right, what are the levels of interaction that a UX designer would work with? Well, you can just be passive looking around a world, which is what people do sometimes with uh, 3D video or 360 video. Uh, but what's much more common is someone looks around and they gaze at something and then they select an object to interact by looking at it. Um, in the more complicated systems, you'll have haptic systems, which are hardware sensors that you'll hold in your hands or attach to your body in some way, and that will allow you to interact or select. Um, there are full body suits, but most people don't have them. And over here, I've given some examples of what those haptics look like. On the low end systems, they are little glorified game pads, like I showed the lower left with the Samsung Gear VR. If you have a higher end system, you will have something you hold in your hand, like those rings up at the top or the Oculus or the HTC solutions, um, and they actually are very good at showing the position of your hands and arms when you're working in there. And they typically will also show the device inside VR so people understand what they're doing. Now, inside VR, another consideration is what are people looking at? Um, the field of view is much higher than it would be for a movie or a web page, and certainly for a mobile. Typically, the viewpoints are at least 90 degrees. They can be 110 in a lot of the headsets, and their people are pushing towards 270 degrees, which will be pretty remarkable if they get there. And then the other range across the field of view is uh, most people can't look closer than half a meter, so the range you have is between about 1 meter and 20 meters for interaction in the third dimension. Now, Mike Alger has defined zones for interaction inside there. Uh, the no-no zone is less than a meter away from your head, and people hate that. They actually will pull off their headset if you do that. And there's an area he calls the hands quadrant, which is a quarter sphere, which is below the user's arms. And then there's a very distant, you can't really interact beyond 20 meters, and that corresponds to about a one pixel uh, width of something. And then the danger zone is like the no-no zone, except it's especially worrisome. And that's basically anything above people's heads freaks them out. So if you have an object, and it comes down, and they look up and see it, they'll just rip off their headsets. Finally, the devices that are higher end will be able to draw a wall. So if the person's walking around the room and they're about to run into a wall, they actually draw a wall so people don't walk in. 
And so I'm showing the behavior, again, Mike Alger's diagram here, where the comfort zone is, which is, again, much wider than tradition, the media you're probably used to. And then we have a peripheral zone where people are aware of things, they might turn their head, and the curiosity zone, which they will explore if you've made something interesting. And in 3D, it looks like this, the no-no region, and the content zone, uh, which a little guy in the center there in the center image. And then finally, the area where you can control and interact is an area um, in the lower half of the body, about a quarter sphere, touch UI zone on this diagram. <coughs> okay, one thing I should also say, text is terrible in 3D. You cannot use text to get your message across. So it's very different from the web or print media. Animated text sometimes works, but you have to be careful. Uh, static text is definitely a last resort, and we're going to need new grid systems to describe this. Um, another issue is how do you get in and out of it? So currently, to get in and out of VR, that's part of the experience, and it has to be designed. And currently, our entry into the VR scene involves a lot of clumsy and possibly frustrating user actions that have to be designed for efficiency. Um, the Web VR API lets us put it into web pages, so in theory you can load up a web page and put it on your headset. But the fact of the matter is no one's really worked this stuff out yet, and so it's a new frontier for experienced designers. All right, a little bit more about technique before we talk about sustainability, uh, the techniques we would have to use given the features of the medium. And we can do prototypes in VR, and they're necessary, but they will not be the traditional wireframes. It doesn't work uh, because you have a 3D environment. So one method that people have used is called spherical gray boxing. And what you do instead of making a gray box the way you would if you were designing an app, is you create a gray polygon that substitutes for an object. Um, another thing is to design a cylinder of interaction. So you don't design the full 3D space, but you draw a cylinder around the person and you put your objects on that cylinder. And what's nice about that, that allows you to unroll it into a flat tool like Adobe Illustrator and then wrap it to test it. And I've given an example of what these sort of templates look like, and this is showing that content zone and curiosity zones. And over here I'm showing the cylinder example where someone has taken the flat screen and they've mapped it into 3D. Uh, the tool here being used is Cinema 4D, which is actually used by a lot of the VR practitioners. Now, responsive design is also important in VR, but here we're not worried about screen size because basically your field of view is full. What we worry about is the quality of the experience in terms of resolution and capability. So our responsive breakpoints would be low-end systems like the Google Cardboard on the left where I can only move my head and that's all. I can just look at things. The next level is where I have a larger field of view, about 100 degrees, and I have a little button so I can select things on the headset. So I can do gaze. Uh, I can basically select things by looking at them and also by pressing a button. Um, and then if I have devices that look like uh, handheld devices, that gives me a greater degree of freedom in there as a break point. And finally, being able to walk in the VR simulation uh, would be the final break point of VR. So what are the affordances? Well, I'm giving some examples from the Samsung Gear VR of what the buttons are that people use when they use Gear VR scenes. Um, in addition to the physical buttons, you can put a flat overlay, which I've shown in the lower right, on the scene that people can select, and a map could also work there. The thing you should not do is a text input field. It's almost impossible to do. And on the other hand, if you can make an object gesture to the user or behave or animate in a way that it sort of explains what it's for. It's almost like sign language. Um, and another thing you can do is make the object look like the thing it's supposed to manipulate. And finally, if you're using a physical haptic device that you're holding in your hand, it has to be replicated in the scene as an affordance. Now the triggers. Prolonged gaze, you can make an object react and then tell you if it's ready to go. It could expand or change its appearance if you stare at it. Um, and the problem is you can't use standard button clicks. Um, you can have someone press a button on the headset, but if you make it where someone pushes their finger out and presses a button, it's more like you put your finger into a container of water. It really does not work well. Uh, the thing that does work is audio. Changing audio cues in an environment is very effective at guiding the experience. And then finally, feedback in a VR world. Um, you can give tactile triggers off of a hardware button. Um, the object you interacted with can move or change in some way. A new object could appear, 
And you have to be very careful with scene dissolves, where you jump from scene to scene, which is equivalent from jumping to one web page or another. If you're not very careful, you will make someone sick or even throw up. Um, as I said before, though, audio changes work really well as feedback. Um, and rather than changing the whole scene, what you can do is open a path, a door, and a gateway to show that I am now in a new uh, state inside my experience. Now, in terms of handling motion, if you move your uh, scene around without the user's consent, which is what you do in video, where you pan and forward movement, you're just going to make them throw up. Uh, if people are looking forward and you move forward, you minimize the negative effects. And another thing that has been used by some VR apps is to reduce the field of view during motion. And that turns out to be really effective at designing a VR experience. And they're using that in the Google Earth VR app. Um, now, what are the experience metaphors that you can imagine moving up to a higher level? Well, you could have a curved wall, which is almost like you're at some trade show and looking around at uh, some booth, and that has been used. It's pretty low end, but maybe it's a start. Um, a related aspect would be theater in the round, where events are happening around you, but you're essentially motionless. Um, you can make room scale caves, and that's most similar to traditional games. It's quite difficult, and to date, I'm not, I don't, I'm not really aware of anything that's worked very effectively. So that tells you, again, VR is not like a game. Um, one of the most interesting experience metaphors people have come up with is that you put the user in the position of being disabled and their disabilities, your limitations, um, are match the limitations in VR. Um, on the other hand, you can make a little workbench and people are moving around virtual objects um, to create something. Um, if you want to show people things they've never seen, one thing that works is the ghost dream, which is what I call it. So you're in a world and you're moving like a ghost through this world. And I've seen some extremely effective things where you're part of the world, you're able to move in it. At the same time, the people in that world can't see you. The final way you can imagine something is I call it gone fishing. You're in an environment and the world moves past you, but very slowly. And that turns out to work really well um, in terms of certain types of experiences. Now the objects, like the ground gives you orientation, the sky gives you scale. Uh, audio fade-ins can help you understand if you're undergoing a change in your experience. Uh, in terms of what you're gonna be able to select, people typically will put a little context rectangle, which I've shown uh, in this diagram at the lower right. Um, and then the objects can create paths or roads or ways I can move or even ways I can move my head. And then finally, something that is novel but works really well is to have a talking object. And they can substitute for text that people would normally read. Now, there are anti-patterns. If you move the user when they aren't moving, which is a very common error in 360 video, you make them throw up. Static text, they won't be able to read it. If you teleport, they barf. Um, if you jump them to a scene slowly, but then you start having action immediately, they won't like it. You need about 15 seconds to adjust to a scene change in VR. If you aren't allowing feedback, like you aren't showing what's going on with the user's own body in VR, um, people tend to find the experience irritating and uncomfortable. And then finally, any sort of motion towards the user, especially coming towards their head, will cause them just to rip off their helmet. And here's some more anti-patterns. Um, one thing you can put in there is a safety barrier because objects should be blocked and people should understand they can't get too close to them. So you might actually have a little fence that these things can't get past. Um, people have to be able to control where they're looking. You cannot just take over the camera, and just, unlike uh, movies and video where that works very effectively. And then finally, another thing that doesn't work well at all is to change person's size and perspective. And that allows some Wonderland size change or an unnatural speed of motion is likely to put them on the vomit comment. Okay, so what have we talked about so far? We talked about why VR is important, the idea it has a very high energy footprint, and that we can design here, but because it has such powerful features of empathy, designing in VR may create allow people to have more sustainable behaviors. And so our goals in sustainable UX in VR are to make UX, uh, the VR itself more sustainable, which means we make it more efficient in the way we use it. And then finally, we craft messages inside VR that make people um, use more sustainable behaviors. And so I call those both structural and storytelling. Now, what would be the strategy for doing this to add sustainability to a VR project? I call it the Ouroboros strategy. 
And so what you do is you create a database, which what I really mean is a table, and you list all the elements you're using to create your VR project. And you look at those elements, and then you find out if there's replacements that are more efficient or greener in some way, and you score that. And if you can, you swap in the greener ingredients for the less green ones. And if you can quantify, you could, but it's very difficult to do carbon footprint calculations on the web, and VR is going to be even more difficult. And we know roughly it uses a lot more power than the web and a lot more resources, but actually figuring this out is really not practical. So following the ingredients model can lower the carbon footprint just because you're picking things you know are greener and you keep swapping them into your project. And so here's some green ingredients that you could use in a VR project. Um, one thing that would work would be to reduce physical discomfort so you don't push people into weird positions and you let them and you maybe allow them to sit and do a relaxed movement in the environment. You can do features inside VR that minimize energy consumption. So you render things only at the level they need to be and you put objects in there only as they need to be in there rather than going for super high resolution. Um, you can do things that maximize inclusion. You make sure your VR system works for everyone whether or not they're on a low-end Google Cardboard or a super high-end Oculus. Um, you create things that allow task completion in VR so you can train and simulate environments. And most importantly, you use the incredibly powerful empathy features of VR that people that connect emotionally to their experience so that they will then transfer that learning more effectively to the real world than they would if they read a brochure or they looked at some website. And so VR storytelling in particular can compensate for its high carbon footprint. So if you use the empathy features, you can change behavior in the real world. And my prediction is VR is going to be vastly better at changing user behavior than any other medium we've ever created. With that in mind, what are VR storytelling methods? Well, one way you can tell the story is that you have people in a video and they're like that ghost I was talking about. And I also call it a God's throne in a world of pain. So you're looking in this world and you see things that cause emotional behavior in your in yourself and so you might experience people in a situation where they um, the environment has been damaged or there's some other difficulty and putting the person there immersed in it even though they can't directly touch or interact will cause a strong emotional reaction another way to do it is to show people things and just scroll it past them if you move slowly, you can show them a lot of things. It's almost like a 3D news feed. Yet another way to do this would be to create a simulation. So you simulate sustainable behavior and the user practices sustainable behavior inside the VR environment. And that might involve them using things there or they might create custom objects to populate an empty world and choose things that are more sustainable. The final thing you can do is that a VR scene just might encourage meditation or contemplation of an idea. And because of VR's empathy features, people are willing to sit there with one idea in their mind for many minutes if you portray it. And you don't have to have a lot of action or movement or anything like that. And they will focus on that idea. And I'm showing Zen Parade, which is a great example of a VR experience that's like that. So what are the stories you could do? Uh, you can show a complex process, like in, in explaining something about the environmental movement or, I don't know, climate change or something. And you build this a model, and then people can walk around and explore. They can look inside it. They can get inside it. And it can be much more complicated than a printer web model. And then people can play with it and understand things more deeply. Another very interesting idea is we tell customer journeys as storytelling, but the fact of the matter is a customer journey is basically a VR experience. We don't need to translate it to a wireframe or put it on a flat screen. The customer journey is our first generation VR experience, and that's one way to think about how you would fit into your workflow. So you place people in scenes that arouse emotional empathy, and perhaps you can even have people to some extent suffer consequences inside the VR simulation of bad choices or show what happens when that happens. And then you have people use VR to practice sustainable behavior. <clears throat> so here's what you need to do. Pretty short. If you're a UX designer and you don't know about VR and you're interested in sustainability, all I can say is where's your headset? You need to move into this area now. This is going to be the most powerful area of creating sustainable behavior that we've ever had in the next decade. So here's what your road is. 
you need to get a headset. Uh, a cheap one would be something like Google Daydream or Samsung Gear VR that might work with your current mobile phone. The next thing you do is you need to experiment with some of the commercially produced worlds like the Steam community. Uh, you will have to learn a little bit about audio to do VR because audio is so important in VR and it's very effective as an engagement device. Uh, you probably do need to go find those blogs. There are several blogs now whose title are UX and VR and that would be a place you could start learning. Uh, because VR encourages long-form thinking, you can move away from this idea that on the web you're always distracted and you constantly have to re-engage attention because you can do long-form storytelling um, inside VR. And that's why I said maybe your customer journey already is a VR experience. And then finally, you have to develop a strategy for creating deliverables to describe VR experiences. And they won't be traditional wireframes. They'll be some of the examples I gave in this talk. And so as a final part, I'm going to post this up on Google Docs so people can get to it. And I have references so you can look up the various things I've talked about, which are the strategy uh, and doing green ingredients and design patterns in VR and some other features of VR. And so that's basically the end of my show. So I want to thank you for your attention. And hopefully I will be in the chat room um, or I'll be able to do uh, some discussion. Otherwise, you can just fire me an email and I will talk to you. Thanks very much. Bye.